We're going to look this evening at the Cooneyites, just in case you thought that was an old photograph of Pastor Dennis from the Iron Hall uh, a number of years ago. It's not, but we're going to take up a cult tonight that not much is known about, though it has a, a unique place in the history of our province because it's the only cult, as far as I'm aware, in the whole of the world that originated here in Ulster. We want to read the Scriptures together, first of all, uh, just as a launching pad for what we have to say this evening. The first portion we're going to read is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, so do turn there with me. 2 Corinthians 11. If you want to turn to the other portions, 1 Timothy and chapter 4, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, first of all. Verse 14 and 15. And Paul the Apostle is addressing false apostles, people who claim to represent the Lord Jesus Christ but are false, counterfeit. And in verse 14 we read, No marvel, do not marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his servants, also be transformed as the ministers or servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And then over, uh, as I said, to 1 Timothy, please, chapter 4. 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1. Paul, again, writing to young Timothy, says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, something that specifically relates to Cuneites, their preachers at least, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. The Cuneites really I suppose the title tonight should be blank because the Cuneites themselves consider themselves as the nameless ones. They don't designate themselves at all, and, and it's outsiders to the group like ourselves who, who have classified them as Cuneites or go preachers. But before we address them specifically, I want to look at some of the characteristics of a cult, and I know your pastor has probably done this in his introductory week uh, to this series, but it'll do no harm for me to repeat it a little, just to so as you understand how we classify any movement, group, or system as a cult. Now, in the introduction of my book that I hope you'll get if you haven't already got it, I take great pains to emphasize the particular characteristics of a cult, and I've classified it into three specific descriptions. First of all, there are the behavioral uh, aspects of a cult, and you will know a cult by the behavior of not only the cult itself, but those who, who join the cult. And I've broken that down into a number of headings, some of which are isolation. A cult will seek to isolate you from your family and friends and indeed any other religious body that you have previously, previously had affiliation to. They also seek to train you mentally by what we could only call indoctrination. Some have classified it as brainwashing. That's a strong term, but it certainly is apt for some of the cults. And they even behaviorally affect people with deprivation. Whether it's sleep deprivation or food deprivation, 
the purpose of which is to weaken your mind and your spirit so that they can have more control over you. So a cult characteristically shows behavioral tendencies like these. There are also structural characteristics to a cult. And those are often uh, seen in an authoritarian, even a despotic leadership. You've got to listen to what the leaders say and obey them without question. And that might be manifest in particular prophet that has revealed the new truth through the cult, or it might be simply uh, the leadership hierarchy. You've got to bow to it without question. Also, structurally, cults seek often to have an overt financial emphasis. And often they get you to pay uh, substantial amounts of money into the cult and even at times leave inheritances that have been bequeathed to you and other people's wills to leave that to the cult and the religious system. And again, this is a way of gaining further control over you personally. There are behavioral aspects to a cult, structural characteristics, but I suppose the main one, and it's the one that we're looking at tonight more than anything, are the doctrinal characteristics of a cult. And I classify these in three ways. Often a cult will testify to have a new revelation from God that is something added to what we have in the Scriptures. Coming from that, there, there is an exclusivity that they manifest in this teaching. They believe that because they have the new revelation, they alone are the true revealers of God's will to this present generation. And they believe that they are the true successors to the apostolic line in the early church. Third aspect uh, that outflows from that is that if you don't belong to their group, the group that has new revelation, the group that exclusively has that new re revelation, you cannot be saved. And if you were a member of their group and you leave it, you lose your salvation. Now, uh, if you want something more specific related to these new teachings, we find that usually there are four elements to these new revelations in the cults. And if you could note these down, I believe they'll be a great help for you in guiding principle in how to recognize a cult. First of all, a cult often doctrinally has a defective view of the Bible. They do not take the Word of God as their final authority, but usually they're added new revelation on top of it. Secondly, they often have a dishonoring view of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we'll find out that the Cuneites have exactly that. Thirdly, they deny justification by faith alone. And that little word alone is of supreme importance. And fourthly, they often have a dangerous stress on trivial matters. And we'll see that exemplified in the Cuneites. So let's turn our attention to that this evening. The Cuneites are also known as the Go Preachers. You can see here on the screen is one of their hymn books from many years ago, and it's entitled The Go Preachers Hymn Book. How do they get the name Go Preachers? Well, it's based on Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 7, where the Lord Jesus said, And as ye go, preach, saying, As ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So they've often been called the Go Preachers. They've been known at other times as the two by twos. Based again on the text of Scripture, Mark chapter 6, verse 7, And the Lord Jesus called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. And the same verse is found in Luke 10 and verse 1. And the fact of the matter is today, the two-by-twos and the Cuneites have evolved into two separate groups. And we'll see why that has happened as we look into their history. But it has to be said that the two-by-twos are active in many, many countries, more so than the smaller group of the Cuneites. It is estimated that the two-by-two -two group uh, has a number of members upwards from a quarter of a million most of them are found in Northwest America, and uh, many more than are in America are found in Australia. Now, this is only an estimation because it's very hard uh, to be specific in numbers, but it is thought 
that there are over 70,000 members of the two-by-twos in Australia. Now, just to put that in context, that's almost as many members as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons have in Australia. So whilst there mightn't be too many Cuneites in the United Kingdom and even Ulster, there are a lot of them in other places of the world, and there's so little known and understood about them in Christian circles. Now, the Cuneites are the smaller group that have very similar beliefs, it has to be said, and they're mainly found in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, in England. Indeed, uh, the most recent United Kingdom census, 2001, said that there was only 200 members in the United Kingdom. But they're also found in Norway, and as I said, there are Cuneites in Australia and America, as well as the two by twos. Now, although they claim no name, and they pride themselves in claiming no name, and we've called them Cuneites, go preachers, and two by twos, they have had to register themselves under certain names in various jurisdictions because the government at times in national history has forced them to do so, particularly in times of war. So in the United Kingdom in 1914, at the outbreak of World War I, when the government wanted to know all the different types of groups that existed in the country, they took to themselves the name, the testimony of Jesus. In 1942, in the United States of America, again at the outbreak of World War II, they registered themselves as a religious body under the name Christian Conventions. And in Australia, they've often been known, and also in New Zealand, as the Christian Assembly. So they have taken names to themselves. Cuneites can be encountered as a group when in a particular vicinity, even here in Ulster, they decide to convene some missionary meeting. In any given locality, they will advertise these meetings and they will not take a specific name, as I've said, but usually the invitations they give out and the signs and billboards that they erect will be very plain and all they will give are the time and the venue, no names of preachers, and often emblazoned across the invitations will be the, the word undenominational or non-denominational. Indeed, uh, preachers might uh, visit local churches in any given vicinity, and they will arrive in that place they will sit through the service just like the, this one tonight. And then after the service, while people are gathering around, they will give out their leaflets. Usually they'll refuse cups of tea at the meeting or invitations back to people's homes for hospitality. They're quite eager to get away, reluctant to give any information about who they are. But they'll invite folk from any church to their mission with the hope of converting them uh, to the Cuneite belief. Missions, as you can see from the photograph, are often held in tents. Conferences are also convened in, in barns, and their church gatherings are always in houses because they do not believe in designated buildings called churches. They believe, according to Acts 7.48 and Acts 17.24, that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. So they actually believe that it is pagan to worship in, in a building that designates itself a meeting house for the church. Now, as I indicated in my introduction, just like any other cult, the Cuneites claim to be the only true New Testament church on the earth today. And so this exclusiveness shines through immediately. It's very evident in their preaching. They strongly condemn a Protestant and Roman Catholic clergy and denominations, indeed any other expression of Christianity other than theirs, is condemned. Other distinctive practices and beliefs of the Cuneites are these. They not only believe that they are the only expression of New Testament apostolic Christianity, but they believe that their go-preachers are the only true and genuine servants of the Lord around today. Their itinerant preachers and workers must forsake all their possessions, according to Matthew chapter 10 that we'll look at in a few moments or two, and they must also take vows of poverty and chastity. They must remain celibate because they believe this is what Christ has commanded. 
Another distinctive and strange doctrine of the Cuneites is what has been come to known as the living witness doctrine. Not only do they believe that their preachers are the only true servants of God today, but they believe in this doctrine that developed between 1905 and 1907 that people can only get saved, according to their understanding, through their preachers. That the Word of God itself is not powerful enough, but it must be delivered by one of their prophets, one of their workers. Now, that living witness doctrine actually caused the split among this group. Split off the two-by-twos, the greater group, uh, and the Cuneites, the smaller group. But we'll look at that in a few moments. But all their beliefs that they hold uh, are, are hard to pin down simply because the Cuneites and the two-by-twos are an extremely secretive group. They don't publish any literature, and they don't record any of their preaching. They have never documented a confession of faith or a creedal a statement of belief. And so, all we are left to do is really, historically, to ascertain from their origins, from their divisions in, in history, uh, from their teachings, as far as we can, from what we hear, particularly from converts out of the Cuneites, what their belief actually is. So, let's look at it this evening. First of all, I want us to consider their origin. As I said, this is a unique cult, because this, as far as I'm aware, is the only cult that was founded and indeed developed in our own shores uh, of Ireland, and particularly Northern Ireland. But it didn't begin by an Ulster man. Its origins came from a Scotsman by the, win, by the name of William Irvine. Now, William Irvine professed conversion to Christianity in the year 1893 in the Scottish city of Mullerwell. The next photograph shows you a picture of uh, William Irvine. He is in the center. Left of William Irvine is William Gill, who eventually became the overseer of Britain uh, to the Cuneites. It's a bit like a bishop. And on the right of Irvine is George Walker, who would become the overseer of the whole of the movement in the USA. Now, it might be a surprise to some of you that after his conversion, Irvine joined the Faith Mission in 1895. Faith Mission wasn't long on the go then. And in 1896, the Faith Mission sent him to County Antrim to be a pilgrim. And eventually he also went south to County Clare. And their history testifies that William Irvine was a very strong leader and a very dynamic and powerful preacher in gospel witness. We are told that he had considerable success in his missions, many converts. But as he went around the countryside in particular, we are told that he had much help in good faith from the local churches of the area. They would gather many of the people. They would allow him to use their premises at times. But it wasn't long until William Irvine began to preach against those same churches, and indeed any other expression of Christianity other than how he understood it. Now, perhaps we've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps without realizing it, William Irvine was setting himself up as a special leader of God's people. Many of the new converts would only be discipled by him, and he sought continually to denounce other denominations and expressions of the Christian faith. Now, because of this, by 1901, the faith mission severed ties with William Irvine, and indeed all the other churches that previously had used his ministry also severed ties with him. Then we come to the year 1884, going back a little for a moment. We're introduced in that year to Edward Cooney. And Edward Cooney also professed conversion. And we are told he won, the same as William Irvine, many converts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it was in the year 1897 that Edward Cooney met William Irvine, and the two of them became co-workers. In 1901, Cooney withdrew from his father's growing business 
in the town of Enniskillen to become a full-time tramp preacher among this new group. And he, just like William Irvine, preached scathing attacks on the churches of the day, frequently directing his hearers and converts to have nothing to do with the churches of his time. Now again, here we're seeing this very prominent doctrinal characteristic of a cult coming to the fore, exclusiveness. This new group claiming to be the only modern successors to apostolic Christianity in our present day and age. Now, by 1904, there were upwards of 150 ghoul preachers. Now, we're not talking about members of this group. We're talking about full-time evangelists. The first annual convention of the group, a great number was gathered in 1904, I believe in the Republic of Ireland. And then uh, not so long after that, in 1913, in uh, Crocknacreve, there was another uh, convention, and the movement was spreading and growing from strength to strength, and it was now becoming more prominent in the British Isles and further afield into the United States and Canada. And that's a little bit of history about the origins of the Cooneyite or the two-by-two movement. But we can't stop there because the story of their origins is also a story of their divisions. You cannot separate the two, and you cannot understand this movement without understanding the great schisms and separations that took place within the movement. So let's look now at their divisions, because tensions soon arose within the group. William Irvine's teachings developed into some very strange and controversial doctrines indeed. Partly it would have to be said, it is thought, under the influence of the Seventh-day Adventists. And moving on later into Irvine's life, it is believed that Irvine thought that he himself was none other than one of the two apocalyptic witnesses that we read of in Revelation chapter 11. It's amazing and staggering to think about it. Irvine, because of some of his aberrant views, refused to accept discipline from the larger group and actually withdrew from them. And from 1920, he lived in Jerusalem under this delusion, self-delusion, that he was one of the special servants of, of God and Christ in Revelation 11. And here's a photograph uh, of an older William Irvine actually standing at the tomb the garden tomb in Jerusalem, and he believed that just like one of these ap 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 apocalyptic witnesses, that he would be slain, and three and a half days late, later, as Revelation testifies, he would rise again from the dead. Well, William Irvine died in 1947, and three and a half days later, surprise, surprise, he was still dead. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 22 tells us, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. And we need not to pow, pow in fear to any man who makes any predictions. If it does not come to pass, we have no need to be afraid, for it's not from the Lord. Now, admittedly, it has to be said that William Irvine had long since left the major group and had split away. But in saying that, we have to come to terms with the fact that he was still the man who gave birth and set the seals both in doctrine and practice to the Cooneyite and two-by-two movement. Well, Cooney similarly had some very strange views. Having said that, the living witness doctrine that was brought in, you remember what it was, that only Cooneyite go preachers and teachers could see people saved. It was only them and their power that could bring a conversion to people. Cooney himself was not happy with, with the import of that teaching and the implications of it. And because of that, Cooney himself was excommunicated from the group in 1928, incidentally, in the town of Lurgan. 
A minority of the group broke away with Edward Cooney, and they were known as the remnant or the outcasts, and they followed Cooney and his teachings. But the greater number were this two-by-two group. So the greater group was the two-by-twos, and the smaller group in Ulster, presently still here, supported and followed Cooney and sought to gain new converts. But isn't it staggering that the Cooneyites didn't even have any room for Edward Cooney? tells you something about the movement. And this old man had to sail to Australia, and the, the group is large in Australia, two by twos, and some Cooneyites as well. And there is his grave in Victoria, Australia. He died and was buried there in 1960. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, to point out to you that the origins of the Cooneyites is a story of divisions, and there is a massive cover-up among the group where this is concerned. Cooneyites are discouraged from investigating it into the history of their early movement because it is wrecked with splits and schism. Now, let's move on. We've seen the origins, the divisions, to the teachings, and look at them more specifically. We've mentioned a few, but it's important that we analyze the Scriptures, and particularly the proof texts that they use themselves out of context as pretext for their false doctrine. William Irvine was fascinated with one particular portion of Scripture, and I want you to turn with me to it now. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, please. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10. The same account is found in Luke 9 and Luke 10, but we'll just look at Matthew's Gospel tonight. I'm going to read verse 9 and verse 10, please. Matthew 10, 9 and 10. Jesus said to the twelve, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script or bag for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for a workman is worthy of his meat. Now, William Irvine, out of these two verses, and the whole passage indeed, developed a, a practice where the gold preachers would be a, a band of men who would go out two by twos preaching the Jesus way. The Jesus way. That is, that we are to live by poverty, and we're only to have one set of clothes like these go preachers, and we're not to live after money. But poverty and chastity ought to be our creed, if you like, among the go preachers at least. So he took this literally. And this is the way the go preachers live today. This is the way Cuneite preachers live today. They do not have their own homes. They only have a one, one item of clothing and they don't have a wage as such. Now, there, of course, are grave problems with this interpretation of these two verses of Scripture. And here we're going to see illustrated for us how cults characteristically take Scripture's texts out of context and make them pretexts for error. Now, watch and learn how not to interpret the Word of God. They lifted these two verses out and failed to notice in verse 5 and 6 that these specific commands Jesus gave to the twelve were given only to Israel. Now look at it. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that's the same command. And yet the go preachers, the Cuneites, the two by twos, didn't they go at their inception to Gentiles? They were founded here in Ireland, and they went to the Gentiles of Ireland. Later, they would go to the Gentiles of the United States and the Gentiles of Australia and New Zealand. But they didn't obey this command, go not to the Gentiles, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, what you've got to understand from verse 7, look at it. And as ye go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This message that the Lord Jesus was entrusting to the twelve as he sent them out and commissioned them here in Matthew 10 was only a preparatory message. What do I mean? 
Jesus had come as the Jewish Messiah, the Christ of God, the Anointed One. He had come to declare the glorious year of the Lord, the Jubilee, that He was here and announcing His kingdom. His kingdom was at hand. It was near in the person of Christ. But you know what happened. Israel rejected Him. And because Israel rejected Him, they would not have Him for a season, and the gospel, therefore, would go to the whole world. And then we have in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, where the disciples and, and apostles are commanded to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. But it is not the same message commanded to preach in Matthew 28. It was not a preparatory message that the kingdom was coming to Israel. But that's what we have here in Matthew 10. <coughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is what they preached. And that's not the same message as we preach today in the Great Commission. This was only to be preached to Israel, not to the Gentiles, but our message is to be preached to the whole wide world. Come with me again to see the error of their biblical interpretation. If you look at verse 8 of chapter 10 again, something else instructed in the commission here is heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. So this commission that they take so literally also included healing the sick, casting out devils, raising the dead, and it is literally meant, not figuratively, in a similar passage in Luke 10, 17, it says that the 70 disciples returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. It was literal charismatic power over these elements. Now, as far as I'm aware, neither William Irvine nor Edward Cooney nor indeed any of their successors ever performed miracles ever healed the sick, ever cast out devils, ever raised the dead, nor do I think they claim to today. But this is the same portion of Scripture. It's the same instruction that they take verse, verses uh, uh, 9 and 10 out of and build their whole system upon. Now, come with me further. We see again, as we've already touched on, that this commission here in verse 9 and 10 and the whole portion of Mar Matthew 10 is temporary. Temporary for the reasons we said the kingdom of heaven was at hand and the Jews would reject their Messiah. But come with me, please, to, to Luke's gospel, chapter 22, for a moment. Luke chapter 22. The Lord Jesus Christ himself in his ministry later rescinds, takes back this command that he had given in, in Luke 10 and Matthew 10. Look at verse 35 of Luke chapter 22. He said unto them, the same group, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, let ye anything. And they said nothing. He's referring back to what we read in Matthew 10. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath purse, let him take it. Likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. The opposite command is given. The previous command is rescinded. And yet the two by twos, the Cuneites, continue to apply a revoked instruction of our Lord. Now, you know what that means. They are, in effect, turning the Word of God into the commandments of man. They're changing God's Word, which is characteristic, again, of a cult. They carry over this temporary command in Matthew 10 and Luke 10 and make it a law for all their workers that they must go out two by two, that they must have no money, one set of clothes, that they're not allowed to have a home, that they're not allowed to be married. And this is a complete perversion of what Christ said, for he rescinded it. And in the end of Matthew's gospel, he gave a greater commission to all the world that was for all of us to take the gospel. Now, it's very easy to disprove this again further if we haven't done enough of that already. Because if we come to the Acts of the Apostles, which is the history book, if you like, of the early church, we see that Peter the Apostle, when he was at Joppa, was alone in Acts chapter 10. And God sent him to Cornelius, and he went alone. He didn't go two by two. Philip 
when he was preaching in Acts to the Samaritans. Incidentally, Matthew 10 told those 12 disciples in that command not to go to the Samaritans. Yet Philip is going in Acts to the Samaritans to preach a different message to all the world. But when Philip went to the Samaritans, he went alone. And when the Holy Spirit miraculously, supernaturally caught him away from that Samaritan revival, if you like, to speak to one lone Ethiopian eunuch, he went alone. And he returned alone to preach in many of the towns and villages on his own. Again in Acts, we have Paul preaching in Damascus alone. Acts 9, he was sent to Tarsus. He went alone. And Acts is packed full of preachers going with the new gospel to Jews and Gentiles. Some of them went alone. Some of them did go two by twos. Some of them went in threes, fours, sevens, eights. But there are no rules about it. Because there are no rules in the Great Commission. And the law of final mention testifies that that's the one we ought to go by. Everybody, one by one or one hundred by a hundred, going into all the world and preaching the gospel to all people. A gospel of grace. Now, as I said earlier, it's very different, or difficult, I should say, to deal with some of the teachings of the Cuneites because they, they don't have a statement of faith. They don't write it down. There's no a doctrinal statement as such. However, from what can be observed, a number of things are obvious from their teachings. First of all, as we have said, they believe that they're the only one true church, a direct historical continuation of New Testament Christianity. Now, you have seen tonight from their origins that there is no trace of the Cuneite movement, the two-by-two -two movement, before her origins in the 1800s. And their aberrant doctrines cannot be found anywhere in the whole of the history of religion. So how can they be the successors of apostolic Christianity? It's ridiculous. And yet, like any cult, they claim it. They also, as we've seen, claim that their preachers are the only true witnesses, and only through them can the living light be brought to people's hearts. They believe that the Bible is a dead book, that it only comes alive when their preachers preach it. And yet God's Word testifies the opposite. 1 Corinthians 3, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos but ministers, by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Corinth was split up into factions. A partisan spirit had split them. Some were following Apollos, the great orator. Some were following Cephas, the man of the people. Some were following Paul, the great intellect. And some exclusive crowd said, oh, we are not of men, we are of Christ. And Paul wants them to see that Apollos and, and, and Cephas and Paul are only ministers. They're only the messengers. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. James 1 and 18 says, Of God's own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. God begot us through His truth. Hebrews 4.12 says of the Word of God, it is quick, it is alive, it's not a dead book. It's powerful. It doesn't need a preacher as such, though God has ordained that method. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God has ordained that through the foolishness of the message preached, some should be saved. And God uses preaching and God uses men. But don't you think for one minute there's no power in God's word. The power and the life is in the seed and God's Word is the seed. And God sometimes bypasses the preacher. Charles Wesley was saved, having read Martin Luther's uh, commentary in Galatians 2.20. His brother John Wesley was saved, reading the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. And there wasn't a preacher near them. 
And you only need to read the Gideon's magazine to see how in prisons and hospitals and hotels people are lifting the Word of God and because it's filled with almighty divine power, the very life of God, people are being saved. We don't need Cuneag preachers. We could go on and talk about how these go preachers live in poverty, and clearly Paul knew what it was to be abased, but he also knew what it was to be ab abounding. He also knew what it was, as he said in, in Corinthians, uh, that he took wages of some of the churches in order that other churches who he was ministering to would not be impoverished. We read in Philippians 4 that he, he frequently received support of the church. And it's nothing sinful for the laborer to be worthy of harm. But what is worse than any of these things aforementioned is their view of the Lord Jesus. And you remember in my introduction that this is one chief theological characteristic of any cult, a dishonoring view of the Lord Jesus. Now, it's, it's unclear how Cuneites view the Lord Jesus as such, but it seems apparent that they do not understand Him as God's Son in the sense of God, a very God, God the Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. They see him as the perfect example, the pattern preacher, the man we ought to follow. That's why they preach the Jesus way, live like Jesus, talk like Jesus, walk like Jesus. He's the one we ought to build our life on as our pattern. But we've got a problem. The meeting like this, a woman said at the door, I'm fed up with you, you preachers preaching the blood of Christ and this gory sacrifice for sins. Why don't you preach Jesus as the example? And the preacher retorted to her, well, do you think you could follow Jesus as an example? And she said, of course I couldn't. And he said, well, that's why, my dear, you need a savior and not an example. Because all have sinned and fallen short of this glorious standard of God's holiness. And Christ is more than an example. John 1 says, He is the Word of God who was with God and was God, the one who made the worlds. Now, they say the Word there is the preached Word from their preachers, but they've got a problem because as you come down the portion of John 1, verse 14 says that that same Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, John said, the glory even of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's Christ. In Christ alone, in Hebrews 1, the Father addresses the Son. Thy throne, O God, O God, is forever and ever. He's God. God of very God, though He is fully and completely human. It gets worse because from analyzing what they teach we very quickly become aware that they do not have a salvation by grace through faith alone. It is a salvation of self-effort. You cannot talk really to a Cuneite about the blood of Christ and a finished work. They don't believe in it. There's no certainty of their soul's salvation. They're following an example that they cannot achieve. They believe it will be decided at death where they will go, where they will spend eternity. And if they are outside of the community, there is no hope for them. If they have left the group, they're damned forever. My friend, if you're a Cuneite tonight, or you were brought up in the Cuneites and you still believe what they believe, or you're not saved and you're trying to work your way to heaven, you might be religious, you might be moral, you might be ethical, you've got to understand that there's a whole book in the New Testament written for you. It's called the book of Galatians. And the Galatian controversy was about a group of people who believed in the cross. They believed that Jesus died. They even believed he died for our sins. But they also believed that it wasn't enough that they had to keep the laws of Judaism, the rites, the rituals, the ceremony, the legality. And Paul came to them and said categorically, that is is not the gospel. The gospel is not the cross plus or the cross minus. It's the cross and the resurrection and faith alone in that, a finished work. 
My friend, I hope you understand this tonight. Very little attention is spent in the Cuneites to the shed blood of Christ and the finished work, but it has to be said in most churches in Iran, very little attention is paid to it either. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, the Cuneites misinterpret what is said there, that this was a record of all that Jesus began to both do and teach. And they say Jesus began to do it and teach it, and it's up to us, the audacity of it, the Cuneites, to finish the work Jesus began. When Jesus said, I have glorified thee on the earth, Father, I have finished the work that thou givest me to do. There, hanging on that rugged cross, when he had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. We don't need the Cuneites to finish it. We don't need sacraments to finish it. My friend, God doesn't need you to finish it. It's finished. It's complete. And it's there for the taking by simple faith. You see, the cross is the heart of the gospel. And if we ever don't get to the cross or miss the cross, we have missed the whole point of what God has done in sending His Son into this world. To be a member of the Cuneites is not about inwardly receiving Christ, but an outward conformity to a lifestyle. It's legalism. Now, just in case I'm not being clear enough here this evening, and you're maybe wondering, what is the gospel? Let me put it to you very simply. The gospel is the good news of the finished work of redemption accomplished for us by God in Jesus Christ through His death for our sin, His burial, His resurrection for our justification and gift of eternal life. His shed precious blood brings us salvation as a sacrifice for sin because He bore our shame. He took our punishment on the cross. And now God can freely give forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7. We have forgiveness of sins through His blood. Now, how do we benefit from that gospel? Very simply, faith and faith alone. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace, a free gift are we saved. Through faith, that not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that means if you come to the foot of the cross tonight, my friend, come to Christ, not by your works, not by your membership to a group, but come as a sinner. And by faith, claim what God has done, you'll be justified. Justification is a judicial act of God. It is God that justifies. He justifies the guilty sinner who believes in Jesus. And the righteousness of God in Christ is given to the sinner. Oh, it's wonderful. There's so many verses I could quote to you tonight, but we haven't time. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, not by works of righteousness that we have done. What shall we do, they said to him, that we might work the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Are you believing in Christ and Christ alone, my friend? It's very good to be a good person. And I'll tell you, Cuneites are exceptionally good people. They are. They're lovely people. As many other religious adherents are. But no apparent holiness of life or religiosity can ever compensate for preaching a different gospel, for preaching a different Christ. And Paul said in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That word is anathema, damned. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. It's serious to get the gospel wrong. It's serious to get Christ wrong because people's souls are lost when we get it wrong. That's why we need to stick close to this book. Walter Martin in his great tome, The Kingdom of the Cults, said a remarkable thing. He said, a cult is a group of people gathered around someone's misinterpretation of the Bible. 
It's frightening to see a man move from powerful, <laughs> dynamic gospel ministry among the faith mission into one of the most diabolical cults that this world has seen. It behoves us all to do, as Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Father, we thank you tonight that our only confession is Christ, that our only creed is the Bible, and our only claim is through faith, for there is nothing in any of us that could earn the merits of God's righteousness. But we thank you in Christ, by grace it has been gifted us. And Lord, if there should be any, whether they be Cuneite or any other iterism, or even nothing in faith, or confession, that tonight they would see their sin, and they would get to the foot of the cross and see a Savior for sin forever, and trust Him, and be saved for time and eternity. Lord, if they're looking to themselves, let them look to Christ. Lord, if we look to ourselves, we'll despair. If we look to others, we'll be disappointed. But if we look to Christ, we'll be delivered, for He is not a disappointment. O oh God, may some look to Christ tonight, and may those who are saved fix their eyes afresh upon him, because we know that thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stead on him. Amen.